Okay, so this is our uh, nuclear physics course, and this course is uh, being recorded at a very uh, important time. You know, nuclear physics started with a few experiments and some theoretical modeling, and we have just completed 100 years of that. So this is a auspicious occasion to start this. Uh, particular course. As you know, all the matter is composed of atoms and atoms are made of protons, neutrons and electrons and all these protons and neutrons are in a small volume which we called nucleus and electrons uh, go around that. So, but uh, how people came to know about this? So, as I said 100 years ago, it was uh, 1909 and two gentlemen Geiger and Marston, they did some experiments and uh, the experiments were alpha particles were uh, bombarded on some metals and then some of the alpha particles came back to, towards the source itself. That means, the scattering was more than 90 degrees, which we call back scattering. So, some foil was there, I will show you a slide. The foil, some foil was there, metal foil and alpha particles were going and these alpha particles interacted with these atoms here and then they came back. Some of them, most of them were going in the forward direction, but some of them came back and from there it all started. So, I will just show you a slide which I have uh, on the PowerPoint where uh, the, the diagram that is published in that particular paper that is there you will come to see how that experiment in 1909 was performed. So, uh, here it is uh, you can uh, see this uh, uh, slide here and it is the title of the thing was this on a diffused reflection of the alpha particle and it was published in proceedings of uh, royal society 1909a volume 82 page 459 to uh, 95 to 500 by these people h geiger and then e marsden and uh, uh, this is the first diagram and in this diagram you can see this is their alpha source it contains some uh, material which had uh, which which were emitting alpha particles and this p this is a lead sheet this was a lead sheet and here this s this is a zinc sulfide screen and the property of zinc sulfide screen is if you bombard alpha particle on this it gives scintillations which one can see so this microscope is here to see those scintillations and this R R that you can see here, this R R, this is a metal foil. So, the alpha particle will go from this uh, source and will fall on the metal and then will come back to this zinc sulphide, create a scintillation and that scintillation will be seen in the microscope. So, this is the diagram and with this diagram, uh, the, with this uh, kind of experimental arrangement, what experiments they did. So, let me draw this diagram on the blackboard once again, so that I can explain it better. So, I am going to blackboard and uh, showing you this diagram in a better fashion. So, you have this uh, lead sheet, let me do it here itself. This is a tube, this is that tube and from that tube alpha particles are coming falling on this uh, R R that is metal and then the here is that uh, zinc sulphide screen which is used for detecting whether the alpha particle is coming or not or where, where it is coming and from here one can look at it and no direct alpha particle should come therefore, you have that lead sheet. So, this is the thing now the alpha particle falling here most of them will go in the forward direction, but then what we are looking here or 
these Geiger and Marsden were looking, where if any alpha particle come back, back scattered, if any alpha particle is is uh, coming in this side. So, that is that was the goal and what they uh, they did, they did find some alpha particles coming here, making some scintillations here and uh, they counted all those scintillations and then many things they did. So, what kind of things they did? So, first was to use different metals, foils, foils of the same thickness and uh, material different. So, they used lead, they used gold, they used silver, copper, eight materials, eight metals, uh, different metals of the same thickness they looked at. That time there was nothing like Z proton number or atomic number or those things. This was beginning of nuclear physics. So, but atomic weight was known. So, from hydrogen how many times uh, uh, different atoms are heavy, that was known from chemistry. And so, they were trying to see if these uh, number of alpha particles are related to the atomic weight. So, different uh, materials copper, silver, gold, lead have platinum have different atomic weights and for that correlation they use these different metals. So, that was one part of the experiment, different metals to look at correlations with atomic weight. Then the other part of the experiment was to have if what, what, what is the effect of thickness? Is it coming from the surface or it is coming from interior? If it is coming from surface, then you increase the thickness of that metal foil and the number of alpha particles detected will not change because the surface is only surface. But if it is going in the interior of the metal foil and then being then getting scattered from there, then if you increase the thickness, then you will have a, a different number of alpha particles. So, to look at that effect, what is the relation between number of alpha particles that back scatter and the thickness of the metal foil, they used uh, gold and they had identical foils. So, they first put one foil and then did the experiment, then they put two foils and then they did the experiment, then three foils, then they did the experiment and this way the thickness variation was studied. So, that was the, se the second part and the second part was uh, effect of thickness. And then the third part was, they just wanted to get quantitatively, how many alpha particles that are falling on the plate are getting back scattered. So, some of the alpha particles are going this side, some of the pa alpha particles are going this side. So, of the total number of alpha particles that are falling on this metal plate, how many, what fraction is uh, scattered in this half, this side. So, for that they did some experiments, uh, for that the, the uh, setup was also slightly different. I am again going back to PowerPoint slide and I uh, will show uh, the setup for this uh, third part of the experiment. So, uh, look at the PowerPoint slide, the same slide once again. So, this uh, second one, this is figure 3 of that uh, uh, paper and this is the, the uh, experimental setup for that third part. Here, the radium source is a very small point source. This radium compound was deposited in a very small area and that uh, was used as a, uh, uh, as a point source of alpha particles. And here is the metal, this is the metal. And uh, here is that uh, same zinc sulphide screen and so on. So, since it is a point, point like source and uh, knowing how many milligrams or micrograms of uh, this uh, radium compound is taken and what is the activity from that one knows how many alpha particles, total number of alpha particles are emitted. And then from geometry, how many of them are falling on this uh, plate that can be calculated 
and then from there how many are detected here on this zinc sulphide plate that is uh, that, that that is the experiment counting the scintillations and counting the number of uh, these things so the geometry of this uh, figure and this figure is different because the purpose was different here the purpose was to get the fraction of alpha particles so the total number of alpha particles going and how much of that is scattered in this direction so all those things were seen and uh, based on this what they found is that of uh, uh, the total alpha number of alpha particles that are going on a metal plate about 1 in 8000 okay about 1 in 8000 alpha particle back scattered that means uh, if i take this number seriously 1 in 8000 that means 7999 alpha particles were gone in the forward direction they crossed the metal and appeared on the other side and one was uh, so largely deflected that it came back towards the source uh, side so the, the, that was the experiment uh, so this was the third part right so the third part of the experiment was that uh, fraction of alpha particles back scattered Now, in this uh, paper, if you read this paper, uh, they have expressed a surprise that alpha particle can come back, because before that the model that was uh, in practice was given by Thomson that uh, all this uh, uh, positive charge in an atom is distributed in the entire volume and similarly the negative charges are also distributed in continuum or discrete, but uh, the things are distributed and if it is distributed the electric fields are quite weak and alpha particle being a heavy particle and uh, the velocities with which this alpha particle comes out of the radioactive material uh, those velocities are quite large. So, such a heavy particle and with uh, such a large velocity, so lot of momentum. So, that is going into some kind of a smeared cloud type thing and then uh, coming back uh, that uh, some surprise was expressed, but no explanation was uh, conceived that time. One year later Geiger did some more experiments and in that experiment uh, the he studied that uh, forward direction alpha particles. The alpha particles which came through the metal foil and appeared on the other side. So, at what angle the most of the alpha particles were coming and how that was distributed. Uh, so, those things were uh, done by Geiger. And then Rutherford, in the schools you must have uh, encountered this uh, phrase Rutherford's gold foil experiment or alpha particle experiments. This popularly known as Rutherford's experiment of bombarding alpha particle on gold foils, but experiments are actually done by Geiger and Marster. But then the genius of Rutherford, of course they were in the, the Rutherford's group only, but the genius was that from that data Rutherford could see that this large deflection can come only if there is a large electric field that is encountered and large electric field cannot be uh, created by a distributed charge and therefore, the charge must be concentrated somewhere which can produce uh, a large field. You also know that if you have a let us say you have a spherical charge distribution. So, if you have a spherical charge distribution some rho some positive charge everywhere here 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 and then at this uh, surface if you look at the field that field will be some q divided by 4 pi epsilon naught capital R square. And then inside you know at the at the center the field will be 0 and as you go towards this uh, surface the field will increase and then it will reach this. So, the field everywhere 
will be less than this. If you go outside, then also the field is less. If you go inside, then also the field is less. At the surface, where it is maximum, there it is this much. And then, uh, if this R is more or less known, 10 to the minus 8 centimeters, and the so if you do anything with that uh, radius, with that uh, particular uh, uh, distance, the maximum field will be utterly uh, incapable of creating such large deflections. So, the Rutherford uh, uh, thought of this model or came out with uh, a new model, if you have a large electric field which can deflect the alpha particle by more than 90 degrees, this r has to be very, very small. And if it is very, very small, that means entire at least one kind of the two positive and negative, one kind of the charge has to be concentrated in a extremely small volume. So, that was Rutherford's model that he gave in 1911. That original paper reference also I am going to show you on this uh, PowerPoint slide. This is a scattering of alpha and beta particles by matter and structure of atom. This is May 1911 and this is in Philosophical Magazine by Rutherford, volume 21. And uh, this takes account of experiments reported on alpha and beta particle scattering from metal foils and he developed this theory and then he in the theory he assumes or he, he establishes that the atom has a positive charge capital N times E at the center and compensating negative charge. The whole atom is neutral. Therefore, if there is a positive charge N E at the center, then the negative charge also has to be there and that must be distributed throughout the volume. That must be distributed throughout the volume, so that uh, when this alpha particle encounters this uh, charge N E at the center, those negative charges do not create a big field to compensate or to reduce this uh, large field. So, that was the kind of uh, uh, thing he suggested and there starts nuclear physics. There comes nucleus first time into the scientific world and they, from there starts this uh, nuclear physics. Okay. So, uh, then uh, in that particular paper, Rutherford uh, developed the full theory. That theory is now uh, by any standard class 12 uh, or uh, say BSc first year or so uh, physics uh, is only involved. So, if there is a positive charge N E at the center, which he assumes at as a point charge, he writes in this paper anything less than 10 to the power minus 12 centimeter will be assumed as a point. So, with uh, that kind of uh, estimates of the lengths in mind, he assumes a point charge at the center. Negative charge is so distributed that uh, for those particular alpha particles, which are coming close to this nucleus, uh, the negative charge does not make any uh, much difference, considerable difference. Then he calculates that uh, Kepler's Keplerian orbit, hyperbolic orbit, if positive charge is here and then uh, uh, some other positive charge, so repulsive force and that comes. Uh, uh, so, if you have a center and you send some uh, charge, positive charge here and some positively charged particle, it will be repelled and will go in a hyperbolic path. And then, uh, by what distance it is missing the center, uh, uh, that will decide how much will be the deflection. If it is missing with a large distance uh, here, it will almost go straight. But, and if it is, it is uh, encountering it uh, closer, then of course, uh, the deflections will be large. So, he makes all kinds of uh, calculations of this hyperbolic orbit and comes out with an equation which tells that all right, the number of alpha particles, which are scattered through an angle between theta and theta plus d theta, what should be that number and on which quantities that number should depend. For that, he writes an equation, he derives an equation in this 1911 paper, which we today know as Rutherford's scattering formula. So, I am not writing the formula, but I will just show you what uh, are the conclusions from 
that formula that one can obtain and that is written in the 1900, 1911 uh, paper. So, I will just uh, read it from that uh, slide once again. So, the number of alpha particles scattered in this angle, it is uh, theta, read it theta here, read it theta here and read it d theta here. Uh, you know this, uh, once you go into that symbol format, q becomes theta. So, this number is proportional to cosec to the power 4 theta by 2. Uh, let me just uh, explain a little bit more, what is this number? Number of alpha particles scattered in the angle range theta to theta plus d theta. That means, if I write it here on the board, so if this is the metal foil and this is the direction in which alpha particle is incident and if uh, the alpha particle emerges in this direction at the end, then this angle is theta. And uh, if you find how many and this is theta plus d theta, so this cone, so this cone, how many particles are going in this direction? That is the number which he is looking for and that number is proportional to cosec 4 theta by 2. So, that means, if you uh, change this th and change this theta, put your detector here, put your detector here, put your detector here, put your detector here, you are changing theta. So, the number of alpha particles that you will get in the same detector, the same angle, uh, angle d theta, that will depend on theta as n will be proportional to cosec 4 theta by 2. So, that was one conclusion from that Rutherford backscattering formula. Similarly, look at the power point again. The other conclusion was second, thickness of the scattering material T provided this is small, this one, this one. So, the number depends on the thickness of the scattering. What is scattering material? It is that metal foil on which you are bombarding alpha particles and looking for the scattered alpha particles. So, number of uh, alpha particles is proportional to the thickness of the scattering material. That means, come here, that means this thickness, this metal, thickness of this metal, that thickness if you write T, then N is proportional to Remember, it is not time, we are not writing time. Of course, it will also be proportional to time for how much time you are collecting the data. If you collect it for 5 minutes, you will get some count. If you collect for 10 minutes, you will you are going to get uh, uh, double the counts. So, it is proportional to time also, but this t here it is written for thickness. And then it uh, depends on other things. One is back to the power point slide, one is square of the magnitude of the central charge, capital N E, he writes it capital N E, today we write it capital Z E, but in that Rutherford's original paper, he writes central charge capital N times E. So, square of the magnitude of the central charge, magnitude means whether it is positive charge, whether it is negative charge, later he establishes that it should be positive charge but in the original paper positive negative both could as far as this scattering formula is concerned both will give the same result. So, square of that and then finally, 1 by capital E square. What is capital E? Capital E is uh, half m u square or m v square. This is the kinetic energy of the alpha particle, incident alpha particle. So, it is uh, inversely proportional to kinetic energy square. So, all those things are, are, are there and uh, then he takes data, actual data which are reported in Geiger's paper and Geiger-Marston's paper 
and then he compares the data with this formula. What is predicted from this formula and what are what data are available and uh, taking care of all experimental uncertainty and this and that everything he uh, finally establishes that it must have a, a nucleus inside it must the positive charge must be concentrated in a very small volume and negative charge should be distributed uh, here and there. The question of stability how these uh, negative charges are uh, are still there they are not falling in the, into the nucleus into the positive charge he says in the 11, 1911 paper that we will not talk about the stability of the nuclear uh, of, of this atom how the, if the nucleus is uh, concentrated at the center and the electrons are uh, everywhere in the volume how those uh, electrons are uh, not falling in the nucleus so that stability problem he avoided avoided although he makes a hint that the electrons must move in such a way that they are stable so that is the birth of uh, nuclear physics so we have completed just completed 100 years of nuclear physics and uh, uh, we should celebrate through looking through these original papers of geiger and geiger marsden and, uh, and rutherford then there were series of papers after that because once the nuclear model of atom came into existence number of uh, researches and number of uh, publications were, were made through now i give you a small overview of uh, uh, the course that we course content that we will be doing in something like 40 lectures or so okay so overview of the course now first is familiarization with nucleus okay so one has to get familiar with the nucleus how it looks like and for that uh, i'll i'll spend some uh, few lectures on that and what what i mean by this familiarization is uh, just to to get to know if you want to familiarize with a person or with some machine uh, or some object uh, you just want to know the shape and size and uh, its structure first how it looks and then you want to go deeper inside inside what is there and so on so that is the uh, familiarization there will be several things that will be talked about in this uh, section let us say in this group the first will be let's say size how big is the nucleus river force says that uh, it's very small and he, he puts a number uh, something like 10 to the minus 12 centimeters or so, but then different nuclei. Today we have uh, about 100. Okay, that's also familiarization with nucleus. How many nuclei are there? How many varieties of nuclei are there? So we have uh, almost say 100 atoms in the periodic table, and uh, each atom in the periodic table has a different nucleus, a different proton number. So 100 different nuclei are surely there but then for the same uh, atom that means with the same proton number z you have uh, 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 different neutron numbers and that is also stable for example you know hydrogen and heavy hydrogen both are hydrogen hydrogen has one proton whereas uh, heavy hydrogen has one proton and one neutron both have one proton and therefore both are hydrogen but there is an extra neutron. Similarly, look at iron. Iron has 26 proton and uh, then 30 neutrons. Most of the iron that we have, iron nails and iron angles and iron uh, chairs and doors and whatever iron you see in any form, uh, iron form or iron oxide form or anything, that iron, most of the iron will have 26 protons and 30 neutrons. That is a nucleus of iron but then 2 percent about 2 percent of the natural iron is also iron 57 that means 26 protons and 31 neutrons that is also a, a good nucleus and it is a nucleus of iron. So, iron has at least these two varieties of nuclei more in fact 58 also is possible. So, z is 26 but neutron number can be 30 or 31 or 32 so all these are stable. So, for one atom you can have two or three or four varieties of nuclei. So, total if you look at it about there are 300 or more 
stable nuclei. So, uh, that is also an attribute. How many nuclei? We will talk more about these things. I am only giving you over, overview at this moment. So, that number. So, could be say 300 stable. And what do I mean by stable? That is also a question. And then, if there are so many 300 of nuclei, not all will have the same size. You have hydrogen atom, you have beryllium atom, these are light atoms. Lithium, these are light atoms. And then you have iron, you have copper, you have zinc, you can say they are middleweight. And then you have uranium and platinum and all those things, those are heavy weights. So, all these 300 nuclei are not going to have the same size. Some of them will be small, some of them will be large. So, how this uh, size is related to, uh, let us say, uh, number of protons, neutrons and so on and how it is experimentally measured. So, those things we will uh, familiarize ourselves to so, size and the number, then the stability. Why can't I have a nucleus of iron with 26 protons and 80 neutrons or 26 uh, protons with uh, let us say 5 neutrons? We can't have it. So, that is a question of stability what decides the neutron versus uh, proton number or ratio, so that a stable nucleus results. So, that stability we will talk and in this we will talk what is called binding energy. Of a nucleus, then we will talk about nuclear forces so inside nucleus you have protons and neutrons and then the neutrons are electrically neutral and protons are all positively charged so so many protons with positive charge are packed in a small volume why do not they fly apart because of the Coulomb repulsion. So, you, you know apart from the Coulomb force, apart from this electromagnetic interactions, you have a different kind of uh, force which we call nuclear force or nuclear interactions, which is attractive at those length scales and that binds. So, to know about that force, we know about gravitational force, we know about ele electrostatic force, Coulomb force or magnetic force Q V cross B what is the formula for nuclear force between say proton proton or proton neutron or neutron neutron. So, that will also be a major topic. Let me come to power point and uh, let us see what uh, other things I have written for that. So, familiarization and then uh, binding energy and stability value uh, what makes the what kind of combinations are stable and then we have uh, this nuclear forces, two nucleon interactions and then we will come to this multinucleon nucleus. Multinucleon nucleus means, uh, see when you start a topic or start studying about something, first you start with a simple system. Uh, so, uh, if I am, I am talking of a nucleus, where do I start? Nuclear forces, where do I start? We start with a nucleus, if possible, with just two nucleons proton and neutron, a collective name for that is nucleon. So, proton is a nucleon and uh, neutron is a nucleon. So, we call them nucleons. So, two nucleon, that is the minimum, the simplest possible. So, simplest possible nucleus is nucleon, a two nucleon system. A, what two nucleon system exists that we will uh, study in the, in the course, but then once I know how two nucleons interact with each other, the next thing is when in a nucleus you have more than two nucleons, what happens? It is not a simple superposition. Similarly, in atomic physics you start with the simplest atom that is hydrogen. 
one proton and one electron. Next is helium, two electron system. Once you go from hydrogen to helium, now lots of complications will be will be there. Similarly, here we will go to multinucleon system. That means a nucleus in which there are several protons and where there are several neutrons and then how these protons and neutrons together, how the forces are there, how the interactions are there. Structure. If there are 50 of them, how these 50 are distributed or arranged? Are all of them uh, uniformly distributed or there are selected uh, shells or paths, uh, whether they are all uh, just uh, at rest or they are vibrating or they are rotating and what they are doing there. So, that internal structure that also we will study in this and then our next uh, topic will be nuclear decays. This also you are familiar with uh, radioactive decays from your school days, the alpha decay, beta decay and gamma decay. Gamma decay is not exactly nuclear decay because the nucleus only energy changes, but in alpha and beta particle nucleus changes itself, it is a structure number of protons and number of neutrons. So, those uh, radioactive decays are there and apart from that uh, you have varieties of reactions, so that also can be grouped with this. So, nuclear decay and uh, reactions, I can write it nuclear decay and reaction. All this going to have a lot of quantum mechanics this alpha decay, how that alpha particle which you know is a two protons, two neutrons combination a nucleus of a helium. So, how that alpha particle comes out of a nucleus alpha decay. To understand that you have a, to invoke lot of quantum mechanics. So, I, I, I suppose that you have done some quantum basic quantum mechanics when I will be doing these lectures, I will be trying to do as much basic uh, calculations as I can, but still remember lot of quantum mechanics will be needed to understand alpha decay or beta decay or any kind of uh, reactions. Then our uh, next topic will be on, let us uh, look at this, our next topic will be nuclear astrophysics, very good, very nice topic, nuclear astrophysics. You know astrophysics? physics beyond the earth, physics in a space. So, astrophysics and then nuclear astrophysics, nuclear physics uh, which is uh, which is there in space, in stars for example, it is absolute fantastic stories. If you read about stars and read about what kind of nuclear reactions are going on stars. In fact, that makes make a star a star. Uh, it is a star because nuclear reactions are going on, because nuclear fusion are going on and that is why it, it, the moment this uh, nuclear reaction stops, then the star will also uh, will, will die, will end its life and will not give any light. Our sun is a star and you know in the sun you have uh, all these protons becoming helium and all those things and from their energy is coming. and. Uh, not only proton becoming helium, uh, for bigger stars there is lot of temperature and lot of pressure and a, a variety of nuclear reactions take place there. And all the elements that you see on the earth or in the solar system or in the universe, all kinds of silicon and carbon and nitrogen and uh, uh, iron and everything phosphorus and calcium and sodium and uranium and everything. All these things were formed inside some star through nuclear reactions and uh, at, the, at those temperatures and pressures, many of the nuclei are formed which we do not know on the earth because we do not have 
those temperatures and th those pressures in our laboratories. So, neither they are uh, commonly around nor we can produce them in our laboratory because those kinds of temperature and pressure that we do not have here. So, all these uh, nuclear reactions at those temperatures, at those pressures where uh, uh, some nuclei are formed which we do not have on the earth called exotic nuclei for example, those things are going on and the whole universe is uh, stable and is there because of these nuclear reactions inside those objects, celestial objects. So, all these uh, come under the term what we call nuclear astrophysics. So, I will be talking little bit about, uh, about that. Okay. Then uh, we have uh, a topic nuclear energy. Okay. So, that, that everyone is familiar with nuclear energy. A good fraction of the energy that uh, we consume comes from nuclear uh, reactors and through what is that uh, um, fission. So, this is on earth and fusion in the sun or in the stars. So, uh, our reactors in India, they, they do this nuclear fission there using uranium 235 and from there energy in the form of electricity is produced and that uh, electricity is sent to our houses and so on. So, those uh, energy production is there using this uh, nuclear fission on earth and uh, stars produce their energy using nuclear fusion. So, at least in the nuclear reactors, uh, the way we produce our energy is controlled. We know how much energy we are producing and at what rate we are producing. There are also uncontrolled nuclear energy productions that you know, which you call weapons, nuclear weapons, where uh, huge amount of energy is produced in a, in a very, very small time and uh, so much destruction takes place because of that. Uh, controlled and uncontrolled nuclear energy. So, there is a good physics behind and then a good engineering behind to make a reactor, to run a reactor, all the safety issues and all those things. It involves a lot of physics and uh, engineering. We will talk uh, a, a part of uh, this uh, course will be on uh, this nuclear energy issues also. Nuclear fusion we are trying to do on earth. For a long time, scientists are uh, trying to make energy, make electricity from nuclear fusion as it is uh, uh, done in stars, not electricity, but the energy is produced in stars through fusion. So, here also on earth, uh, scientists and engineers are trying to do that, trying to make energy from fusion. So far, is, it has not been very successful, but uh, if, if it succeeds, then it has a great advantages because uh, it will create much less radioactive pollution and also the supply, fuel supply, the basic fuel with which one has to uh, work, that also is much more abundant as compared to what is needed for nuclear fission. So, we will talk about these things uh, as the course proceeds. Okay. Then we have uh, something on uh, experimental tools based on nuclear interaction. In 100 years, nuclear physics has developed in different shades. So, to understand the nucleus itself uh, uh, is still an un ongoing activity and then how nucleus uh, or nucleons interact and how this uh, uh, all these things are there, the understanding part of it, the theory part of it. But in these hundred years, nuclear physics has given the, the mankind a lots of uh, tools in medicine, in, in many things. Uh, so, so, those uh, experimental tools uh, that we will be discussing, some of them are 
So, let me write nuclear experimental tools. So, some of them are let us say Mosbauer spectroscopy. Now, this uh, Mosbauer spectroscopy is a, a kind of experiment which is used by physicists, by chemists, by biologists, by geologists, by archaeologists. So, there is such a huge application. What it does? It gives you the changes in nuclear energy levels with an accuracy of say one part in 10 to the power 10 or 10 to the power 11. So, this is a kind of experiment which is used by chemistry people, by physics people to understand the very local environment of some specific nuclei on which this Mosbauer spectroscopy is uh, can be done. Uh, it, it, there are some limitations also, uh, it cannot be done on any system. So, iron is iron 57 is the most favorable nucleus on which Mosbauer spectroscopy can be done. So, if you have any system, superconducting system or any system in which iron is there and you want to know the local environment of that iron. So, this is uh, one of the very, very powerful tool, we will talk about that. Similarly, you have a neutron activation analysis NAA, neutron activation analysis. So, here also uh, very, very minute uh, quantity things can be can be probed if you have a sample and you want to uh, to uh, uh, know its composition and other things you activate by neutrons you put neutrons into it and then the neutrons go there they make it radioactive gamma rays are emitted and all those things so this is also a tool which is very widely used by uh, scientists and engineers then uh, you have uh, for example pixie What is Pixie? Proton induced X ray emission. Proton induced em, uh, X ray emission. So, if you have, for example, in pollution studies, you have some uh, aerosol sample in which you want to know uh, some concentrations of some toxic elements which are in part per millions, very, very small concentration. So, but this is one tool. This is one tool with which you can do that. What it does? It sends a proton beam and then that proton beam falls on the sample and uh, excites uh, the atoms or the electrons and then uh, uh, x-rays are emitted and these x-rays are characteristic of the particular atom that is there, particular z that is there. From there, you know how much is cadmium or how much is, uh, is, is mercury and so on. So, for trace element analysis, uh, you use uh, this. Similarly, there are many of them which uh, one can. Uh, uh, so, there are very varieties of uh, nuclear experimental tools and ion beams. Ion beams, you, you, you have ions and you accelerate the ions and then you allow these ions to interact to fall on some materials and then these ions do some kind of modification in the material and from that ion matter interaction many things can be done. It is a, it's a very hot area. So, using these ion beams uh, uh, alpha particles Rutherford alpha or that Geiger Marston alpha particles uh, experiment that was uh, some kind of some kind of uh, uh, ion matter interaction. But uh, today we have uh, ion beams where uh, starting from hydrogen to uranium any kind of ion with any kind of charge state charge state 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 10 plus 15 plus that can be accelerated through mega electron volts or giga electron volts or even more to do uh, what is desired. So, we will talk about some of the nuclear experimental tools that are there. So, this is the kind of overview what uh, you can expect in this uh, 40 lecture uh, or about 40 lecture course. So, I have given just glimpses.
the nuclear physics is uh, is quite exciting. It interfaces on two sides. One atomic physics, atom is there and then electrons are there. In atomic physics, mostly you talk about electrons, but then those electrons interact with the nucleus and therefore, this nuclear physics uh, uh, has an interface with atomic physics. And then the nuclear physics also has an, an in interface with what you call particle physics inside the nucleus. When you go outside, you get atom, you go inside, inside you have protons and neutrons, but then inside protons and inside neutrons, you have quarks and other things. So, all that, that, that leads to particle physics. So, this has a both interface with atomic physics and particle physics and a basic uh, nuclear physics uh, uh, when you do, uh, you are prepared for both of them. So, that is it. So, now I will uh, give you list of some useful books, which if you can get from library or you, if you can have them, uh, that will be helpful. We, I will be talking about all these things here, but then uh, some uh, material, if you can go back and study uh, at your own uh, place, that will be nice. So, you would like to note down uh, some of these books. One is, uh, you can see here, one is Introductory Nuclear Physics by Crane, published by John Wiley and Sons, a very good book, very good textbook, slightly older. Then you have this uh, second book, Basic Ideas and Concepts in Nuclear Physics. This is uh, K. Head and this is Institute of Physics Publishing. That is also a very nice book. Then you have this Dunlop book, Richard A. Dunlop, Introduction to the Physics of Nuclei and Particles. Thomson publications, now the, the name has changed, Singes or something. Then you have fundamentals of uh, nuclear physics, this is Zeli, Cambridge University Press uh, uh, publications. Then you have this introduction to nuclear physics, W. N. Cottingham and uh, D. A. Greenwood, Cambridge University Press. Then you have this new book just come, introduction to engineering aspects of uh, uh, nuclear physics. It has uh, just come and it is published by a Delhi publication, uh, this uh, I K international or so. Shantanu Ghosh is the uh, author. Okay. So, these books if you can procure, that will be helpful time to time, you can refer to these books and that is it. So, that is all for today. Thank you. Thank you.